Oh, without further ado, I'll introduce our moderator for today, Marette. She is the president of Empath Tracks, and she is here to help us navigate the contract conversation. So Marette, I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you. And I thought I'd start by thanking you, Morgan. Um, Morgan is PMA Executive Director for your amazing tireless commitment and passion for our community. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to welcome today's panelists. I'm going to let them introduce themselves. Um, and I'm, we're, we're really privileged to have them here. And I can't wait for this. But I would also like to acknowledge two elephants in the room. Um, injustice and privilege. And we've been hearing those two words a lot lately. And I thought that might be an interesting segue into this, into today's uh, webinar, which really talks about the win-win in agreements for the production music business. So without further ado, um, Jeff and Todd, take it away. Hey, good. Uh, Great. Appreciate so, it. Thanks very much. You know, quickly, just a, a one minute. On long bios and stuff. And a lot of you, you know who Jeff and I are also. I'm Todd Brayback. Uh, for 37 years, I was executive president and director of worldwide membership for ASCAP. Uh, I teach at USC. We both teach, teach at USC for the last 20 years, uh, a, a course on music publishing, licensing, and film, television, and video games, and song contracts. And I uh, wrote the book, uh, Music, Money, and Success, The Insider's Guide to Making Money in the Music Business. The eighth edition just came out. Uh, so it's like 656 pages of incredibly important information. A real bedtime reading for all of you. Yep. Yeah, in fact, the, the digital version, I think it's about 1,200 pages, so more than that. It's a really hefty read. Yeah, Je Jeff Brabeck, I'm Senior Vice President of uh, BMG. We're the fourth largest music publishing company in, in the world. Uh, my role at the, uh, at the publishing company is really uh, legal and business affairs. Uh, I'm primarily involved in acquisitions and new, new technology deals. Um, but I'm also very proud to be on the board of the Mechanical Licensing Collective, uh, the MLC, uh, which was established by the Music Modernization Act. And uh, I'll get into our role very briefly in, in a little bit, but it has to do with we're the, the non-for-profit organization that was set up by the U.S. Copyright uh, Office and in the law uh, that's going to track and, uh, you know, interactive uh, mechanical digital royalties. Uh, we're going to establish a, uh, a database and a portal so writers and composers and lyricists can actually go in and see if their songs have registered. And we're, we're the ones that are going to be monitoring the payments from the digital companies and distributing the royalties. But I'll, I'll briefly get into that in, in a little bit. But I'm uh, very proud to be on that board. Yeah, okay. it's, it's an audio right only. Yeah, it's audio right. And it's a, uh, it's a, uh, inter it's a, uh, not not for profit. That's on the board of directors of our songwriters and uh, composers and music publishers. Yeah, one of its main main roles is the whole meta, uh, metadata situation. I try to get uh, the best out of metadata for all types of uh, perform works, and which really relates back into the, the field we're about to discuss right now. Because metadata is so important in the uh, production music area. Uh, you know, our, our past history really. You know, we've been dealing with myself dealing. Uh, with uh, the traditional film and TV contracts, uh, uh, scoring contracts and writing for, for song contracts for maybe the last reasons I got out here back in 1978. So really, uh, the, uh, so I know that field well, and there's a lot of similarities between the contracts in the production music area to film and television uh, scoring contracts and stuff, and you know some of the song contracts also. The important thing when we start out here is to keep in mind that the production music area, library music, you know, whatever one wants to call it, I like production music uh, business, is a very different business model than the traditional like film and television scoring and sync licensing situations that Jeff and I have dealt with, uh, you know, for, for many years and stuff. Uh, it's important to understand that because a lot of the clauses in these agreements are the similar to the traditional type of agreements. Uh, and then some of them are, are not, which really relates to the type of business model the production music is. You know, basically, as all you know, production music, I'm going to simplify here, it's pre-recorded, pre-cleared music, a one-stop shop where, you know, uh, you know, entities go to, they can go to online, into the uh, production music library, choose what they want, and then get, uh, put it into their productions. Obviously, I'm simplifying here, but uh, that's the basic premise of what we're doing here. The 
types of compositions you're dealing with, the standard tracks, which is most of the production music, uh, uh, you know, when you go into their sites, premium tracks, which are really a bit more, uh, they have full bands, orchestras, and stuff like that. Uh, and you've got custom tracks where, you know, you're actually having composers write specifically for a particular show or a particular re request and stuff. Then you've got some libraries have uh, uh, re-record libraries where they actually do cover versions of well-known songs. So you know, a lot of different different variations in this area. Many types of companies are in this uh, in this field. You've got the major music publishers, major enter entertainment companies, medium-sized companies, standalone production music companies, small ones, boutique ones. Then you've got the composers who actually have their own uh, production music libraries as part of their uh, their uh, field. So a lot of different entities uh, in this uh, in this area and stuff. The just basically the type of deals uh, on a, you've got maybe a per track deal or, or a needle drop type situation when they're licensing you know, you know music to uh, users or you got a blanket basis where with certain variations where the blanket agreement, let's say with NBC or with uh, A and E or uh, a streaming Netflix, a streaming service, you know, it gives unlimited use or some type of variation of that for everything within the library for some kind of negotiated fee. Uh, again, so those are the two basic uh, types of deals going on here. As I said, the contract clauses, a lot of them are very similar to the film and TV scoring uh, type type deals and stuff. We cover all this stuff, uh, particularly the film and TV uh, clauses uh, in the book and stuff, so you can really get, get the depth uh, in that area. There are similarities and there are also major differences. Uh, that's because it's really a different business model. The, uh, uh, let's see. The, uh, let me see where we want to go here next. Uh, yeah. Oh, okay. One of the things that the, on, the, on the PMA site, there's an absolutely great explanation of what uh, production music publishers do. I, I really do recommend that and go into deal on each of the little uh, items that are on there because it really sets up what a production music library, a music publishing company is doing. Let me just ask Jeff to quickly, I mean, just in, you've worked for publishers your entire life. I mean, <clears throat> remind people what publishers do. Uh, just, a, just a brief explanation. That's good. And I, I really keep this short, but uh, uh, we, we've got a very important role in the, in the entertainment in industry. Uh, obviously, you know, one of our roles is, uh, you know, protecting music. Uh, you know, if in fact a uh, political candidate uses a, a composition without permission, we'll go and, and, and do what we have to do to take that down. Uh, if you're an infringer, if you, you must be doing a lot of work. Because, yes, there is a lot of work these days. It's always bothering. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, we, 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 we monitor infringements. We look after, you know, infringements. We, uh, we, we, we to take down notices. We actually uh, sue people if we have to uh, who are infringing our copyrights. Uh, so protection is, is a really important element of what music publishers do. Uh, basically, another aspect, and this is one of the more important aspects, is promotion. You know, as simple as that. We're promoting compositions. Uh, whether they be 70 years old or, uh, or just, you know, newly created, uh, it doesn't really matter. You know, composition is a composition. A musical work is a musical work done by creators. And our role is to promote it, uh, to promote those songs that, or, you know, instrumentals to television, to motion pictures, to video games, to uh, you name it, to artists who sample. Sample, sampling is a really important aspect of advertising. It's huge. Uh, I, 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 advertising agencies, uh, you know, uh, we've, we've got entire staffs that have connections with all the various uh, producers of the, that, those type of media. Um, in negotiating sampling licenses, uh, uh, basically determining uh, how, if someone samples one of our songs, you know, how much uh, should we charge, how, how much of the new composition, uh, what percentage should we take, etc. Another area is registration, not only in the United States, uh, with the Fox Agency, with ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, GMR, the Performance Rights Societies, but also our registration around the world through our sub-publishers and foreign performance and mechanical rights societies. Um, also distributing information, correct information, on all the U.S. copyrights uh, to all of our representatives around the world, and by accepting uh, the correct information from foreign, uh, you know, territories that uh, send us information that we or 
information on compositions that we we, uh, we represent here in the U.S. Yeah, I mean that, that, that whole registration thing. That's an exceptionally important thing that production music libraries do, and the uh, you know that's the only way you can really track and, and get uh, you know correct payments on things is the registering with all the uh, collection societies in the U.S. and and throughout the world and making sure that information is correct. Yeah, uh, another thing is just negotiating licenses. Um, there are so many multiple types of licenses coming in these days because there's so so much new technology, uh, you know, including holograms and you name it, uh, VR, et cetera. So, you know, we've got to stay up to date on how to license, how to protect our compositions, how to make sure they're used so we don't miss opportunities, but also protect, uh, you know, the composer, or the lyricist or songwriter so that there's fair compensation, um, you know, in all of these new technology situations. Um, being involved in legislation, being part of the uh, NMPA, extremely important. Uh, you know, the Copyright Royalty Board proceedings, uh, which are going to start uh, in about six months from now, uh, looking at uh, rates that will be in effect uh, two years from uh, from this coming January 1st. Very expensive process. Uh, you need experts, you know, and there are experts on either side. Uh, keeping track of films, uh, all the stuff that's in production, uh, what uh, media needs, what producers need music, etc. cetera. Um, dealing with foreign territories, you know, getting the rights of publishers, uh, you know, that know their market, who can protect and promote the songs, get new recordings, uh, foreign language recordings from various territories. Um, Another thing, supporting songwriters, supporting composers uh, and, and lyricists uh, through, you know, agreements that, you know, provide advances. Uh, we've got development deals for newer writers uh, to, to get them to a level where they're more professional, uh, give them studio time, give them instruments, et cetera, you know, provide them support so they can actually, uh, you know, create and, and become, you know, better creators. Um, as, as opposed to, uh, you know, worrying about, uh, you know, going, getting a, a side job, et cetera. And also setting up collaborations is really important because many writers need a collaborator or collaborators to expand their, uh, their creativity. Some do not. Um, and, you know, some are in bands and, you know, they, they keep it by themselves. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of roles here that the music publisher accomplishes. So that, that's why I'm proud to be uh, involved in, in this type of uh, you know, setting because it really supports songwriters and creativity. Yeah, but we, which is a good summary because you know, production music libraries, to me, I, I've always looked at them, I've been dealing with uh, them uh, for, for years and stuff, and I've looked at them as, you know, they're, they're legitimate publishers, just like anyone else, uh, uh, we're way beyond that point. And uh, almost everything you mentioned is something that they do. So it's important that particularly composers and songwriters who are you know, being hired by uh, production music libraries understand the role of what that company is actually doing for them. As I said, it's a different business model. The one that we're used to primarily is when uh, you know somebody's coming to you as far as sync licenses to put a particular hit song into a feature film and, or a TV show or you know uh, when they uh, uh, major studio wants to hire a James Newton Howard or Hans Zimmer or uh, Alan Silvestri, all people I signed in my career, know very well, <laughs> sorry, Todd, but you know, we have extensively have 40, 50 page contracts, but you know, it's a different business model. These are, the companies are trying to uh, get people, get companies and users to come to them, look at their catalogs, which is pre-recorded, pre-cleared, so you're not worried about any type of additional negotiations, and you're picking and choosing what you want there. So it's, uh, as I said, it's the same, but dissimilar in some ways. The quick thing before I get into just really the basic contract clauses that uh, you know you need to know. Or we'll, you know, kind of simplify the explanations here. But quick thing about in the production music area, the two areas you need to know as far as the compensation goes are really the, what is the sync license, what does that mean, and also performing rights organizations, PRO monies, ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, GMR, and all the foreign performing rights societies that writers and publishers join for performances. I'll cover the PRO stuff a little bit after down the line here, but just basically to tell people what a sync license is, because you're, you're dealing a lot with that, and a lot of the compensation in the production music area involves a sharing of the sync license, at least certain uh, aspect deals are that we've got to involve that. Yeah, it, it, it's interesting because my side of the business, and, and you know, BMG does have a, a very large <clears throat> pre production music uh, division, uh, so which is different from pretty much what, what, what I'm involved in. 
I'm more involved in, in sync licensing and you know synchronization licenses basically putting a, 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 musical, a musical work into an audiovisual work. You know, it's, it's really as simple as that, putting a song or a master recording into a TV show, into a motion picture, into a video game, um, you, you name it. As long as it's audiovisual, we're dealing with sync license. So my area has, it's, is pretty much all negotiable. You know, we, we don't have set rates in, in most of the, the areas that I'm involved in and, and the BMG uh, normal sync department in, involved with, with one exception, and I'll get into that, which it has to do with the music and dance centric uh, compositions or shows, which are licensed totally different, differently. Uh, basically, in my area, uh, and you know, the non-production music side of the area, I'll give you two quick examples, and then I'll, and I'll, I'll be very, very brief about this. When one of my favorite uh, TV shows is Westworld, and uh, a few weeks ago, uh, I think it was the last scene of the, uh, the, the most recent series, uh, there was a scene uh, of the two, uh, the, uh, two main characters looking out into the city, uh, and it, uh, a song called, um, not called, uh, Pink Floyd's Brain Damage. Uh, was was included as, as a background vocal, which uh, started off uh, during the last scene of the episode and then moved into the closing credits where, where the, one of the main characters says, this is the new world and in this world you can be whoever the F you, you want. And, but it was, a, it was an interesting use. To, the wild thing about the use brain damage was also used in the first uh, episode, or one of the first few episodes of the initial series, uh, of Westworld, so all of a sudden here we are a few series later, the song is still being used. That, that's one quick example. Another example, and this is totally different, are is the night angel, turtle, and frog, you know, singing songs on Mass Singer, or one of the performers uh, singing on, on The Voice, uh, which, which to me is one of my favorite music-centric shows, only because uh, the, the judges respect the artist, uh, they choose pretty good music, I must say, and uh, there's a nice rapport and there's a really support, uh, you know, for the people, you know, going on in that show. So it's not negative at all. Uh, two different ways of, uh, to license. Uh, the, the Westworld way, which is the dramatic series, basically the fees are all negotiable. Now you have to fit within the, the series budget, you know, the episode's budget. So you can't get totally nuts unless, you know, they really want a song for a particular reason. But there are budgets in all these shows. But you know there's a range that you can negotiate. But the life type of license they use is a um, all media excluding theatrical license. So life of copyright, uh, there's a one-time fee, and I say excluding theatrical. That means you can't put the episode or any portion of the series into a motion picture theater. Now there are some exception exceptions to that because um, uh, what, what was the uh, the series? Um, Okay, Game of Thrones. Oh, okay. Game of Thrones was actually put into the motion picture theaters a couple of years ago. So two episodes went in. So the, 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 the normal license wouldn't cover that. But pretty much, uh, it's an all media, excluding theatrical. Uh, and all media is exactly what it says. Very, very broad. You can distribute that show into any media, you know, whatsoever, excluding putting it into motion picture theaters. One-time use. Uh, I mean, one-time fee. Uh, your synchronization fee. Uh, the only other monies you get are the back-end royalties from the performance rights societies or if there are soundtrack albums or downloads, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So that's pretty straightforward, uh, purely negotiable situation. Uh, in, the, in the music and dance centric shows, it's a different scenario. Um, and first of all, uh, they're not life of copyright agreements. They're normally very short term agreements because these shows, you know, are very topical. There's another voice coming every six months. Uh, they're very limited in territory because take the voice, there's a voice in almost every major country of the world. So people in those countries are not looking at the US voice. Uh, they're looking at their own voice, et cetera. Um, so as I said, they're li limited territory, uh, very, very short term, anywhere from one year to two years, pretty much. The fees are not large. They range anywhere from $1,600 to about $4,700 for the initial license fee, and which, which is a small fee compared to normal TV dramatic series fees. Um, the interesting thing is all the, all the uses are by timing. So you've got various categories, take the voice, you get a certain fee for up to one minute and 30 seconds, and an, another type of fee if the song is over 130, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the media is pretty much all forms of television, 
there are loads of options in these uh, music and dance epic shows. Uh, electronic self through uh, entire episodes, uh, per performance clips, all of these things have dollar amounts that uh, that you know can be added on to initial fee out of context to advertise talk talk show cross clearance options like if someone uh, goes from one show uh, the night before to the view and and does a song there's a, a set fee for that uh, there are extensions of the territory from us and canada or us to the world for additional uh, uh, you know, fees, et cetera. The one thing about, uh, as I said, the, the fees in this area are not negotiable. Uh, they are all on a most favored nations basis, which means every song gets paid the same way, or if they're using masters, it's all, the, all depending on, uh, you know, the timing. And so there are there's no negotiation whatsoever. Uh, basically, you either say yes or no to get your song in. Uh, if you don't like the fees, then your song doesn't go into the show. So everyone's paid the same way. So that's the two types of licensing areas that are going on in my non-production music field. Yeah, and it's, it's a good point because it gives the basics of what a sync license is. But it's it's a very different situation because Jeff is really dealing with hit songs. I mean, yeah. which is not what you're finding in a production music library. You're looking at the you know uh, entities out there, a particular production or network, something like that which wants very high, uh, very good music, uh, you know, high, uh, uh, very well done music and stuff like that, professional music, but not at the price that you're actually, you know, looking for, uh, for regular sync licenses. But the sync license concept is, is the same, right. licensing a particular composition into an audio visual uh, product and stuff like that. So again, it's a good uh, primer on it, but, uh, uh, with certain exceptions, it doesn't apply in a lot of cases to the production music area. Yeah, correct. Yeah. And when, one of the questions that came in from uh, before we uh, went on the uh, air here was, you know, about budgets. And a lot of times they'll run into shows that have uh, a lot of the sync licensing will um, take out so much of the, the budget that there's not much left for the composer. The reason for that is that sync licenses can be very high, particularly for well-known songs and stuff. And the composer agreements a lot of times come in at the end, and they're separately negotiated, obviously. But uh, that's why you'll see in a, a particular composer agreement an exclusion if it's a package deal that all sync licensing is not taken or is not taken out of the package, obviously. But still, it does affect budgets in a lot of cases, particularly in, in television where it's all budget uh, driven. So, just a quick thing: the, the PRO thing, as I said, I'll handle the, uh, later because that's the second element that's very important in, in these contracts. The basic contracts in the production music area, I mean, you've got the services, uh, you know, it's really uh, what the composer uh, or, or songwriter is hired to do, uh, delivery specifications of what they're doing, uh, responsibility, who, who has to pay for the cost of the particular uh, production, whether it's the production music company or the composer themselves in certain deals. Track and writer information, uh, very important for the metadata. Uh, the term, you know, there'll be a term of uh, how long uh, this uh, certain thing has happened. I'll go through some examples when we go through this territory, almost always the world and the universe, because uh, you need this stuff to be able to be performed anywhere. Uh, grant of rights in the media, very similar to what Jeff is saying, all media now known or hereafter uh, uh, invented and stuff like that. It's important not to have restrictions on the media, particularly for production music uh, companies. Uh, copyright ownership. Uh, they're in the main, they're work for hire agreements uh, with certain exceptions where uh, the uh, uh, company, the entity, becomes the author of the work under the copyright law of the United States and stuff, and really owns all rights and then grants certain rights back to the composer or the songwriter as part of their, their agreement. Uh, correct? Anything you want to add on that, Jeff? No. No? Okay, fine. But work for hire concept, very important. It's something that in all my years of dealing in the traditional film and television area, but those have a contract. They're almost all work for hire agreements, so this is nothing unusual. Uh, they have warranties and representations and indemnity clauses, which most people don't read. Why are they important, Jeff? Yeah, the, the indemnity clauses are extremely important because, you know, especially these days when there are there are claims coming everywhere because of, of, of the of the internet and, and people comparing things, etc. Uh, I'm not making any any, any judgments here uh, either. But the indemnity clauses are really important, and a lot of people don't look at them because, uh, you know, if in fact, uh, you know, someone feels that your work is infringed, you know, upon their work, um, 
you, you can definitely be, uh, you know, taken into court. Uh, you, you know, there's statutory damages and non-statutory damages, which would be very expensive. Uh, hiring a lawyer is very expensive. Uh, you could have all your royalties withheld, um, et cetera. There's a whole bunch of, uh, you know, ramifications to that particular clause. And, and pretty much you should really look at that and negotiate that, that clause accordingly. That, uh, you know, who, who pays for the, uh, for the lawyer if, in fact, there's a claim? What if the claim, uh, what if you win the claim? What, what if you're judged not an infringer? Uh, who pays the costs? There's a whole bunch of issues there. We've got a lot of stuff in, in the book on this, but indemnification clauses and warranties are very, very important and, and should be looked at very carefully by any composer. Yeah, good. Yeah, as I said, you know, there are some clauses just people don't read because they're they're intimidating to say the very least. But they are are very important both on the introduction to the publisher as as well as the uh, as well as the writer. You know, certain other uh, compensation that which I'll cover separately, uh, different types of compensation uh, that are going on these deals, notices, the assignment, whether they can assign it, force majeure if there's a war or act of God, how the contract can be canceled. There's breach agreements with who the composer breaches or the company breaches, what to do. You know, the very standard clauses and stuff. Uh, I'll give you a couple of examples of just uh, in more detail. Like here's, here's one, uh, company engages composer to write, compose, and deliver for exclusive exploitation all composer's interest in a certain number of compositions, new and original music cues, and to record, produce, and deliver new and uh, master recordings of it. Territory, the universe, rights, work made for hire. Uh, and I'll say that the compensation in this one, and I'll get into this separately, but I'll just read these agreements. Pay composer a certain amount of money as the composing fee, then 50% upon full execution of the agreement, 50% about on when the uh, composer produces the uh, recordings that's satisfactory uh, uh, to the uh, production music library. Uh, in this one, the composer gets 100% of the ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, or GMR money, with the publisher getting the, the full 100% uh, publisher share. Uh, that was one agreement. Here's, uh, let me give you another, uh, oh, here's another one, where there was an advance uh, of a certain amount of money versus all monies and royalty payable to the composer. Uh, again, 50% the sign, 50% the delivery of the amount. Full, uh, you have to re recoup the cost first uh, of the production before, uh, you know, which uh, before the advance can be uh, completely recouped. And then there was a 50% of net receipts received deal. Now, what that means is when you see 50% of net receipts, but there are quite a few deals like that in this area where the composer is getting that. I mean, what are net receipts? Well, the net receipts are basically the, uh, after all the, the costs of collecting or representing the, uh, the, the compositions are taken off the top, then the, that, those are the net receipts. So I'll give you a quick example. If, uh, if compositions are performed in, in a foreign territory, uh, there's a sub-publisher in that territory who's monitoring uh, you know, those performances and making sure they're paid you know, through the local performance rights society and, and making sure they're registered. Uh, that sub-publisher um, is a publisher just like a US publisher, but they happen to be in a foreign territory. And they take a fee for, for what they do. It's a percentage normally of, uh, of the money that they receive. Let's say the sub-publishers in France, uh, your music is performed in, in shows that are actually performed or broadcast or streamed in, in, in Paris or France. Um, the societies collect the money, then the, um, the local sub-publisher will, will take, uh, you know, will be, the monies will be remitted to them. They'll take their fee for representing the composition and monitoring the, uh, the performances and protecting the composition and send the money back to the US. What comes back here is minus that sub-publisher fee and that's basically net receipts. So it's, uh, it's after the sub-publisher fee normally. Okay, uh, does that have anything to do with the US uh, earnings? Uh, I, normally not no. because the, uh, n normally uh, the societies will take their, their fees uh, and there, there might be an administration fee charged by the, uh, the the publisher here in the U.S., but uh, and then that, that would be a, a net receipts deal after the administration. Okay. Uh, I'll, give you, I'll give you one more. This was a uh, from an agreement that I, I was dealing with uh, a couple of years ago. Services, because composer uh, and uh, works and uh, deliver all the works, uh, so the requirements. There was no obligation to use the material, obviously, uh, on it. Uh, 
the term. Uh, there was an exclusivity in this term where uh, it was effective from the date the composer started to, uh, to work, uh, and it ran through the period of time that he had to produce. I think it was a two-year service in the beginning where he continued to produce a certain amount of, uh, of compositions and recordings for this particular company. Uh, there was a clause in there where the, it was interesting because it was not there was not exclusive, so the composer could actually work on traditional type television projects. So, which is important because it has nothing to do with production music. Uh, but if he was this particular, uh, if he or she was hired to let's say score NCIS an episode, they could do that without affecting this particular deal. Warranties and representation in this uh, was a fifty percent of gross receipts uh, deal in this one. You know, uh, no sense contract. That's interesting. Yeah, no other compensation. Uh, in addition, uh, other than the uh, gross receipts and the getting the ASCAP BMI CSAC uh, uh, deals. Yeah. There's one issue that comes up in the direct licenses, which I'll cover when I get to the performance there. Here, here's another one, just to give you the, uh, and the rights, this is a good example of what, uh, the company shall have the right to utilize the works in such manner as company of sole discretion shall determine, without limitation, the right to make any and all changes to the works, uh, can exploit the works by any and all means and any and all media, whether now known or known or hereafter devised. Uh, exclusive right to administer and exploit the works and to print and various various other things. It goes on and on, but it really is an important thing that publishers, whether they're production music libraries or any other type of other publisher, needs because one has to have the ability to license your works in for any and all media. It's particularly important for the production music area because. You're, you have pre-recorded, pre-cleared music, and it's not like a regular publisher who they come to you and say, I want this particular song, and you go to a big agent and you say, you know, I want uh, Hans Zimmer or uh, James Newton Howard or Randy Newman to score, uh, then you negotiate that type of deal. It's a whole different world. It's already there, you go in, you look at it, where it's appropriate for your production, you choose it, and whatever the going rate is for that particular production company, that's how it works. So yeah. again, the media thing is absolutely essential to it. Uh, and again, the uh, I'll give you, I'll just go into the type of agreements, the compensation agreements, because that's really what a lot of composers and songwriters look at first, without, you know, without reading the rest of the contract. And there are a lot of different variations in this whole field. I mean, uh, years and years ago, there were a lot of buyouts. There were work for hires, buyouts where there were no back-end royalties at all. Back-end royalties mean it could be the PRO monies or mechanical royalties or sync money the monies. Uh, uh, you have certain spec deals where the composer will go to a company, uh, no upfront money, to, and they get a percentage of the license fee from the company. You get salary staff writers, uh, they you know, normally getting 100% of the PRO monies, the writer share. Uh, 50% of the fink fee, which is fairly common in a lot of situations, a lot of the deals where the composer is actually getting 50% of whatever the sync fee that the uh, production music library uh, collects. Uh, PRO monies, uh, it's important in the PRO area where one of the licenses where uh, any type of copyright owner, regular publisher, music uh, production company publisher, doesn't matter who, they can if the, if the user does not have a license with ASCAP or BMI or the PROs, or if they have a production company or even a user, let's say a, a streaming service, wants to use your work, and the only way they'll use it is under a direct license, meaning they bypass the PROs, and they can do that through because the non-exclusive agreements with that writers and publishers signed with ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC are non-exclusive, meaning they can license their works outside of the PROs. So, you know, in those kind of cases, if there are direct licenses that are negotiated by the production music company, you know, the writer should look at trying to uh, get some kind of compensation for that because it's not coming through the PROs. Now, certain deals have that, other deals uh, don't, uh, don't have that. Uh, some deals are PRO monies, no sync fees, 50% uh, of net receipts received that went through, uh, uh, some there are advances uh, against all monies and royalties payable to the composer, uh, subject to full recoupment of the advance, uh, and any you know, mixing, mastering, and musicians' costs incurred. Then the company can pay 50% net receipts and some other type of formula. So 
a lot of different pornos out there. Uh, let me see if I missed any. There are others also, but th those are the basic ones. And the ones I've seen primarily are a sharing of the sync licenses or a net receipts deal. Almost all of them have the PRO monies going directly to the writer, uh, composer, or songwriter, and the PRO monies going directly to the music public. That's essential in practically every deal because that's the primary back end for any type of production music, as well as practically any type of uh, regular scoring for film and TV uh, uh, productions and stuff. You know, where we did a uh, uh, some articles for the uh, SCL, the Society of Composers and Lyrics. Lyricists, which is a great organization, but on the whole back end royalty situation, uh, let's see what it is. Yeah, I must say, what Todd's looking. Yeah. I just want to mention one thing. Yeah, the difference between the area that I'm in and production music uh, area, it's almost it's very similar to the music and dance centric shows where the producer, you know, the actual production company that's putting on these shows, they need to know what songs have been cleared. Uh, you know, they need that flexibility to choose as, as opposed to asking a publisher for a song uh, and the publisher has to go to the writer for approval, et cetera, et cetera. There might be a number of steps involved. That's why a lot of the music and dance centric shows, they actually uh, pre-clear hundreds, if not thousands of songs beforehand, which is very similar to the production music area, where the users who want to use music want the assurance that if they choose something, that they can use it. And so that's, that's a main difference between uh, you know, my area of the business and the production side. Yeah, I, think, I can't find the uh, SCL, the Society of Composers and Lyricists. We do, we've done quite a few articles for the score over the years. Uh, we actually won the Deems Taylor Award for them back in 1990 for a, two articles we did on the increasing value of film and television copyrights. We followed up, I think it was 2009, where we went through the uh, standard type of, uh, of uh, back end royalties that you see for film and TV writers, but uh, the, the, problem, the increasing value of film and TV copyrights and the many worlds of composer and songwriter music licensing deals. The only problem no, with- No one saw me get up, right? right. <laughs> right. It was hidden. Yeah. But it was funny. And the reason a lot of the production music agreements don't have back-end royalties in, in a lot of them, other than the PRO, the sync, or some kind of other uh, situation, is I, I look back at the article and we had the uh, back-end world. Godfather theme uh, being used in a video game as, as the theme. He's a pirate from uh, S S Score from Pirates of the Caribbean. Birthday greeting card. Peter Gunn theme, Chase Bank commercial. Halloween theme, ringtone. Everything I do, I do it for you. American Idol movie song segment. Circle of Life, Broadway show. Over the Rainbow, use in motion picture. Obviously, these are not the type of uses that you're going to see from a uh, production music uh, library. Uh, you know, they're really other types of uses. So it's a good article if you want to look at back end royalties and everything else. The book covers an awful lot, but in most cases, it's not really applicable to the production music area. Yeah. I mean, the, the reason why it is applicable is that, uh, you know, all the composers in this area, you know, are, are composers, they're creators, and, you know, they get into a lot of other different areas. So it's, it's wise, and you, you've got to know the business, all the aspects of the business. Yeah not just for the production music side, uh, because your music could be used anywhere. Yeah, and it's good also because, you know, they, you have very you know, extensive careers uh, uh, yeah. outside of just what you may be doing for the production music area. So uh, you do need to know the back end royalties, uh, even though they're not appropriately really applicable to the, to the production, production music area, stuff like that. Quick thing on just, just so you know, uh, the type of uh, deals that uh, the production music libraries make, you know, as I said, needle drops or single track licensing is one. The blanket agreements are very important. And they're really basically, it sounds like a, a PRO type of blanket agreement where you have an unlimited use of an entire library's catalog, or you can have variations of that. I'll give you a couple that I uh, run into. Uh, here with a blanket license for, uh, dealing with only trailers, promotional spots, and interstitials for a particular uh, network. Uh, this one, another one was all episodes of a specific series. All series are made by a particular production company. Background usage for promotions only. All forms of merchandising, advertising, promotional, uh, as well as websites, games, and apps. 
Another one was all station clients who request a source license, meaning a license that bypasses the uh, PROs and stuff. So media is any and all media now known or hereafter devices, always in, in all, all of these and stuff like that. Again, blanket licenses are important because you know composers in many uh, contracts uh, do share in the blanket license uh, monies that are, are, are taken by a production music company. Uh, you know, many times you'll see reporting versus non-reporting licensees. So you really have to figure out if you have a lot of music uh, in a, a recording licensee who actually reports usages to the production music company. You know, you, you do get a percentage of, of that non-reporting licensees where there's no reports given back. They just use anything they want without any type of, uh, you know, report on it. Uh, then you would want to try to negotiate some type of uh, deal where you do get a percentage of those type of uses uh, if they are using, in effect, using their work. So again, it goes into some complex contract language, but again, it's just something to, to keep in mind uh, if you're in those type of situations. Uh, on it. Quick thing on PROs, just to give you a crash course, really, I'll cover just the main things that affect you. Again, it's the main source of back-end royalties for the production music libraries, as well as the composers and songwriters. In the States, ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, and GMR collect about $3 billion. Whereas important, about $800 million comes in from broadcast TV and cable, obviously the main source of production music uh, uh, performances. Uh, the online area has grown significantly, $600 million total for the US PROs. Again, that covers a lot of the audiovisual streaming services where you do see a lot of production music uh, being used and stuff like that. Foreign incoming uh, is for $750 million that comes into the US PROs from foreign collection societies for US writers and publishers works. Most of that is writer money because as you know, publishers in the main are collecting through sub publishers from these societies or through being direct members of those societies. So again, a lot of money coming in and much of it is in the audio visual area from uh, tele regular television broadcast uh, and radio, which there are production music is, is used in that area, as well as the uh, audio visual streaming services, as well as feature films. Because remember outside the US, feature films, when they're shown in movie theaters, are licensed by the local PRO. So, you know, it's normally about 1% of the box office goes to all music in those productions. And then the money is sent back to ask at BMI, CSAC, or GMR, depending on who you're a member of as, as a composer or a songwriter. A lot of deductions off that money at the top, but just think about uh, Avengers Endgame. I mean, uh, obviously Alan Silvestri had the score, but there were a lot of songs in there and stuff like that. And, you know, I think it did $1.9 billion in foreign theatrical royalties. So there's a lot of money in that field, which most people don't pay attention to. And it does affect, you know, there is money for production music uh, uh, companies and writers, because a lot of uh, feature, a lot of films use you know, production music. Uh, uh, the quick thing, type of licenses, I went through them direct and source of the two that bypass the, uh, uh, that bypass the PROs. Most are blanket licenses where the user can use anything they want out of the ASCAP, BMI, CSAT, or GMI repertory. Uh, remember how license fees are determined with ASCAP, BMI, there are rate courts that actually uh, resolved just if a reasonable fee cannot be come to an agreement between ASCAP, BMI, or the user. They go to court, there's a trial, the judge actually decides what the fee should be in that area. Uh, in the in the audiovisual areas, keep in mind that it's a limited number of areas. At ASCAP and BMI themselves, they process five trillion performances. That's one million million is one trillion. So you can try to figure out the number of performances. 98% of those are digital. So as you can see, uh, no, I'm going to go through some numbers here, give you an idea what stuff is worth, but 98% is digital, and digital is about $600 million total for all types of uses. You're going to start seeing numbers that are very small on a per performance basis versus when you have stuff on broadcast TV or ba uh, basic uh, cable. Here's just some uh, you know ideas of network TV, the highest paying PRO uh, uh, payments, run about, I'll give you a range, depending on who you're with and, uh, and uh, uh, what type of use it is. Feature performances, visual vocals, between $1,250 and $2,500. Writer, equal amount to the publisher. A theme runs between $400 to $1,400 for the publisher. 
uh, equal amount to the writer. The score, probably between $120 to $225 per minute, uh, again, for primetime network TV. It goes on from there. I'll give you an example. A&E uh, could be $120 for the visual vocal, uh, $50 for the theme, 100% of $12 to $20 for the score. HBO might be $200 to $300 for a visual vocal, $65 to $175 for one minute uh, for a theme, $21 to $31 uh, for a piece of score. So again, the value that you get from a PRO determines on the license fees of a particular station or media. And that's why you can see, uh, you know, they vary because of the size of those things. Just so you know, in the audio visual area, which is most of a uh, you know, production music, type of use is very important with the PROs, theme, visual vocals, score, promos, logos, ads, they're all paid differently. Time of day and audience measurement is a factor that affects payment. Duration of the use in most cases affects payment. There are bonuses for highly rated Nielsen shows, theme bonuses and primetime shows, uh, number of people, number of performances in a quarter, history of past performances. There are bonuses based on the duration of certain types of particular uses, uh, score and stuff like, uh, or you know, songs that are in the background, uh, instrumentals or vocals. So again, PRO rules, we cover them in great, in great detail in the book. They do affect your payment as how it's used. Quick thing on the uh, streaming services, audiovisual streaming services, I just gave you traditional media. Here's a theme, uh, 1.4 million views, uh, $56 on Hulu for the publisher, equal amount to the writer, uh, 773,000, 770,000 visual vocal of two minutes, equal $157. If you had 15 million views, it'd be $2,800. Uh, here was one where I compared network TV, 12 episodes, prime time, time the theme that was worth $700 each, $8,400 to the publisher, equal amount to the writer. You would need between five and nine million performances on the audiovisual streaming services to make that same amount. So again, uh, I just put, you have to put the digital area into perspective. Uh, based on the traditional media area as far as uh, composer and music publisher PRO income. <clears throat> Same thing happens overseas where I looked at three societies, very important uh, for all composers and publishers, the overseas performance monies. I looked at uh, uh, it, uh, SASM, the French Society, PRS for Music, the English Society, and SOCAM, the Canadian Society. They collected about $1.9 billion in domestic revenue about 600 million of that was for TV and radio performances. About 400 million, 490 million was all types of digital performances, audiovisual and visual. So it's a growing number there. It's about 25% of all income outside the US. But again, everybody's dealing with tr trillions of performances in that, that area. This, uh, uh, instead of the ones that we're used to, where there's a limited number of uses on web network and other broadcast TV. So the numbers are very, very different. Yeah, let me, I'm going to interrupt a little bit. Excuse me, this is fascinating. I think we could be here all day. It's amazing. We are so lucky. But I did want to um, leave some time for some questions. Um, let me just ask a couple of them, and then maybe we can wrap it up. And I would like to assure people that if you type in your questions, um, this is recorded. We will get those questions over to them. And uh, hopefully, Morgan, are you in agreement? We can post the questions and the answers. And um, so I, I would like to start with one question. If you could speak to the subscription model that libraries are exploring. Um, in other words, where clients pay $99 a month for unlimited use of library tracks? Well, I must say, I mean, we we deal with subscription services uh, in the video game area and a few other areas, and then pretty much how how we work it, or there's or there's also uh, an online music uh, lessons, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, what we normally do is do a percentage of the uh, of the uh, subscription revenue, or if it's an ad supported uh, situation, then we'll take a percentage of the uh, the advertising revenue, and then we'll. I've seen percentage go from anywhere from 12% to 
to 25, uh, even a little bit higher on occasion. Uh, so that's how we deal with, uh, at least in the, in the non-production music area, that, that's how we deal with subscription uh, revenue. And that's, that's becoming more of a, a factor, I must say, oh, especially yeah. in the video game area. Yeah, no, exactly. In, in production music and any other area, because people are into subscriptions. And so, you know, a lot of the companies are negotiating these things separately, but that's a good, at least, overview of uh, how, how you deal with it. Yeah. Great. And I think almost in a related question, um, one, one participant is asking, if you're creating music for um, all these production libraries, what's the benefit for the writers and composers? The space seems so saturated. Well, the, the, the benefit is, first of all, you, you get work. It's very high quality uh, production these days, as opposed to like, you know, 40, 50 years ago. But now it's like, uh, it's, you know, it's really, it's, it's less expensive music uh, for a lot of users who don't want to hire a composer uh, to score a particular thing. They need bits and pieces of music that fit a certain uh, uh, genre or type of music and stuff. And it's there, so they just have to search for it and then they can use it and stuff at a price that's more reasonable than actually doing a sync license with a major hit song or a scoring agreement with, you know, composers and stuff. The, so there, you know, um, the, again, it's a different type of business model and the sync licensing and the, uh, uh, and the uh, PRO monies, you know, can be, you know, significant in a lot of cases. If you're a, obviously if you're a big library or if you have an awful lot of compositions that are being used, you know, you're, you are really looking at the back end. That's why in the back end in this area, is primarily the PRO monies, which is why I just wanted to make sure people understood the significance of digital audiovisual streaming services, license fees versus license fees and royalties versus traditional media, which most people are still used to. And you just need an awful lot of more performances of a particular episode that you have your, your music in. It's as simple as that. Yeah, and, and I must say, speaking of saturation, the, the music industry, the creator industry, it's enormously saturated. Look at how many writers there are with ASCAP and BMI alone. But, you know, does that stop anyone? No. I mean, uh, I, I feel, you know, the good creators will, you know, will, will, will be discovered. Uh, you got to find a way many times, but uh, it's a saturated business and you can't worry about saturation. You just worried about, you worry about your own talent. Uh, it's as simple as that and then what you're creating. Yeah, I mean, and, one thing, the reason I like the production music area is that it gives composers and writers a chance to really develop their skills yeah. and actually produce really good music, even though there's no guarantee of it being used. So, which is opposed to like somebody hires a score for it. So that's important, I tell you, because there's so much good music, you go to these production music library sites, and it's incredible what they have up there. So, you know, I can see why it's such a huge part of the audiovisual business, uh, much more so than a lot of people realize. Yeah. And also you can use the, those sites to you know, to show our producers of other types of uh, music and other types of projects, what you can do, you know. So it's uh, it's really valuable. I mean, the, the, those sites, the production music sites, are just amazing. I mean, I'm so impressed by uh, the how they organize. You know, how you can look for things and the quality is just amazing. So we, we could use them for our files here. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Next question. Um, <laughs> just just like stuff. Stump the stars or something? <laughs> Morgan, um, do you have, do, do we have time for one more question? Yeah, I actually have one that I would love, um, Todd and Jeff, for you guys to address. And it came from Paul, um, who says, I'm looking at a deal with a production library that will pay me a flat upfront fee for each track, but wants 50% of the writer's share. Is this common? Uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I didn't mention that one as far as when I went through that list of, of the type of compensations. Uh, you know, anything's negotiable. I, I'm not, I, I haven't seen agreements like that. That's, that's about all I can say about that one. And I just have one more, and I don't know if you have anything to add on this, but with a foreign sub hub, um, do you have a brief explanation on what a post collection term is and means? If one were to want to change foreign sub publishers, do you have any info on that? Oh yeah, definitely. In fact, that that's true not only of uh, U.S. Or, you know, agreements uh, and, and sub publishing agreements, which are more like administration agreements in the United States. 
a sub-publishing deal is normally for three years, it would be standard. Uh, basically, the post-collection means that any monies earned during that three-year period, you know, monies earned in the last like six to nine months are not going to be received uh, by the sub-publisher uh, within the three-year period, uh, you know, before the, the term ends. So a lot of that money, which is like performance rights money, let's say you've got a television show in France uh, that's, that's picked up by SAS and the French Society in December, and the sub-publishing deal ends this, uh, December 31st, that money from SASM is not going to be distributed for another four to five months. So the publisher who represented the composition during the term in which the performance took place will be allowed normally to collect the royalties that were earned during the term, but not yet paid until after the expiration of the term. So that, that's pretty much what post-collection uh, means. Hey, Morgan, let me just add one to that, that prior question, uh, is that, you know, Whenever you, have, I've always in my career have always believed that the composer's share or writer's share should always be given 100% to the composer and the writer, without exception. I also feel the same way about uh, some kind of publishing uh, shares on, on it. Also, so is I don't see them being part of it being giving back to someone else just for to make a deal and stuff. Uh, so. Uh, I mean, the publishing is separate from the, the writer thing, obviously, but I just wanted to make that clear. Yeah, and I'm in total agreement. Great. Um, okay, well, we are just about out of time, so I just wanted to, yeah. Just, because you, you mentioned this before, is that, you know, the, the MLC, the Mechanical Licensing Collective, uh, Morgan and the PMA are going to have a, uh, an entire episode on, on this new organization. Uh, what type of data that, that's required, how you uh, submit data, how things are going to be monitored, et cetera. So Morgan will be setting that up, and I recommend everyone to, to be involved in that, uh, in that uh, you know, hour or so segment, you know, when it actually happens. It's going to happen later in the year because we're, we're working on the portal so writers can go into the Internet and look and make sure their compositions are registered, et cetera. But that's going to be really, really essential. And the uh, MLC representatives are really excited. Um, and I got to hand it to Morgan for that. That's very cool. Thank you. And thank you guys both for, for your time, too, today. We really appreciate the insight and, and all of the knowledge that you have shared with us today. Um, I know some of you guys jumped on late and others that may have missed it. This will be available. It is being recorded. So we'll have it up on our website here in the next day or two so it will be available for you guys to watch back. Um, I want to again just express that we would love to have you as members. If you are not yet a member of the PMA, please contact me, uh, email me so we can get you set up in a membership. It's super important and, and really worthwhile uh, for composers and songwriters as we try to navigate this industry together. Um, I want to thank again our sponsors for today, APM Music and the NMPA. I appreciate so much your support. And last but not least, um, our next session is going to be a master class with a composer. I can't tell you too much more about it yet, but um, it's a pretty cool composer we have lined up, and that will be on July 7th as our next Academy session. So make sure to keep an eye out for that one, and we will... See you then if we don't talk to you before. And thank you guys all so much, Marette, Todd, Jeff. Thank you guys for, for your time. I really appreciate it today. And thank you. Hey, cheers, everybody. Stay, take care and stay well and uh, best of luck. Yeah. <clears throat>